start by saying I definitely cannot predict the future, but we'll try. So I just want to start off to set a bit of context here and just remind everyone how transformational DeFi actually is. So let's imagine a scenario. Imagine you're at a bank or on the phone to a bank and you say to them, I'd like to take out a loan. And they say, sure. What's the purpose of the loan? And you say, it's for investment purposes. They say, OK, cool. They type up an application. How much do you want to borrow? I'd like to borrow 10, 15 million dollars. And they say, what? You say, yes. They say, OK, how much deposit do you have? You say, I have no deposit. And they say, you can't take out a loan for 15 million with no deposit. And you say, no, 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 it's OK. You see, I just need the funds for this one trade that I'm going to make. And as soon as I make the trade, it's going to happen in a few seconds. I'll then profit from it, pay back the loan and the fees, and it will all be good in a few seconds. And by this stage, they're furious. They say, sir or ma'am, you can't take out a loan, $10 million, no deposit, make a trade, and then pay the money back. What happens if you aren't profitable in the trade? And you say, no, 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 it's OK. You see, if I'm not profitable, we'll just cancel the trade, cancel the loan, and it'll be like as if nothing ever happened. And by this stage, they know that you're wasting their time, and you'll probably get kicked out. right? And in this case, the bank manager or bank person is absolutely right. You can't do that. But in the world of DeFi, such a thing is possible, and you can do it today. It's called a flash loan. So it just goes to show what amazing and groundbreaking things have happened just in a couple of years in the DeFi space. And the mind has to wonder what will happen in the future. My name is Harry Papakarisiu. I'm a developer advocate manager for Chainlink Labs, and I'm very excited to be here today. So before we start talking about the future of DeFi, let's start by talking about how we got to where we are today. So DeFi actually started in 2009 when Bitcoin came about. Being able to transact in a decentralized, trust-minimized way is DeFi, right? Fast forward a couple of years to 2014, and we get to the birth of Ethereum. So Ethereum took what Bitcoin had done and added a general purpose smart contract language uh, and Turing complete smart contracts. Absolutely groundbreaking for DeFi. So once that was in place in 2017 or so, the birth of DeFi on Ethereum started to come about. We had protocols that would eventually become Aave, Synthetix, MakerDAO, another massive one, and EtherDelta, the very first DEX. Put your hand up if you've ever used EtherDelta. Yeah, we've come a long way since then. <laughs> Um, after that, 2018, two absolutely groundbreaking protocols launched. Uh, Uniswap, another decentralized exchange, and Compound Finance, lending and borrowing. Fast forward a little bit longer to 2020, and what was 2020 for DeFi? DeFi summer, yes. People were incentivized to participate in these protocols in the form of LP, liquidity provider tokens, and it was absolutely groundbreaking. Everyone was using DeFi, it was amazing. And um, then in 2021, things got even more crazy in the hype of the bull market. DeFi TVO went up like 10 times or something silly, and gas prices went to ridiculous levels thanks to DeFi and NFTs. So that's DeFi up until 2022-ish. Let's talk about what DeFi's, what's happened in DeFi recently. So right now, TVO is at about 55 billion. So Definitely down from where it was in the hype of the bull market last year, but nothing that's not out of line with the current state of crypto markets. Another thing that we're starting to see this year is the rise of multi-chain DeFi, right? So previously DeFi was mostly on Ethereum, but now we're starting to see DeFi thrive on other layer ones and layer twos. You know, Binance Smart Chain, Solana, Avalanche, uh, Optimism, Arbitrism, Arbitrum, sorry, et cetera. So even though most of the TVL, or over half, is still in Ethereum, we can no longer say DeFi is an Ethereum thing. DeFi is a multi-chain thing. So what else happened recently? So we had this thing called DeFi 2.0, right? So DeFi is amazing. It's got all these unique properties, and it's awesome. But it didn't come without its own issues and challenges, right? So a couple of challenges that came is um, the issue of liquidity. When you lock up capital in these DeFi protocols, you can't do anything with them after, so it's not very capital efficient. And uh, another thing is uh, liquidity uh, mining, right? So because everyone's a DeFi degen, 
um, they're, they're going to chase the best yield. So there's no incentive to keep your capital locked up in a specific protocol. So what a few protocols tried to do was to try to overcome some of these issues, um, and, and this is kind of what was called the DeFi 2.0 movement. And some of the advantages of the DeFi 2.0 movement is basically the liquidity mining incentives. So you can lock up capital in these protocols and earn yield on them, but you can then do stuff with them still, like lend them out and things like that. Another thing is uh, insurance as part of DeFi protocols. So if you lock up capital in a DeFi protocol and it gets exploited, the, the protocol get, it gets exploited, you know, you lose your money. So what DeFi 2 sought to offer was insurance against this locked up capital so that if that happens, you have coverage for it. Um, I think they also offered insurance for impermanent loss as well. Another thing that DeFi 2.0 offered is self-paying loans. So you can basically use the interest earned on a loan to then, to, on capital, sorry, that you borrow to then pay back that loan. So that was a quick three or four minute blast of where we are, how we got to today, sorry, with DeFi. So what does the future of DeFi look like? What might it look like? And um, we've heard a lot of this already, um, but I, I think it's important to reiterate some of it. Um, the first thing and the most obvious thing that we've pro all heard is the future is cross-chain, not multi-chain. So there's no longer going to be this concept of native DeFi deployments on each chain with fragmented liquidity. So with protocols such as CCIP, we're going to realize the concept of a cross-chain smart contract where you can put some ETH into a protocol on Ethereum, earn LP tokens there, use those tokens on Solana and put it on some native Solana DeFi protocol there, right? The realization of the cross-chain smart contract. So no more fragmented liquidity. Uh, and it's going to be just like, you know, if I speak to my wife using Telegram or Facebook Messenger, even though I have an Android and she has an iPhone, you know, it doesn't matter because it's all underlying infrastructure. The user experience is still going to be the same for us. So what else is on the horizon for DeFi? Um, probably the most obvious one is uh, a convergence of uh, or integration of TradFi into the DeFi uh, format, and for those who were here yesterday, there was a great talk about that in the morning uh, on the main stage, because in the end, you have banks and they, they have customers and relationships, they want access to these services, they want access to this, um, this new system, this new way of finance. So um, we heard about this concept of a compliant DeFi, and whether that's true DeFi or not, like, who knows, but, you know, there might be a split in the future of compliant and non-compliant, but... Um, the convergence of TradFi and DeFi is definitely something that's going to come. Another thing is uncollateralized lending. So right now, most of the lending in DeFi is over-collateralized because it's kind of anonymous and things like that. But I think um, under-collateralized lending um, is definitely going to be coming into the future for, for DeFi. And there's been some great stuff that's being done by um, people on decentralized identity and things like that. Um, just quickly as well, like flash loans came about out of nowhere, we're also going to see all these other new financial products and services that are going to change the way in which we transact with each other that we don't know about today. Um, but one thing also to note is that I think it's very important that DeFi in its current form absolutely has to remain because um, whether there's regulated, non-regulated, compliant, non-compliant, um, all the innovation happens in this kind of experiment that we're doing right now. So I think it's very important that that's still available in the future. So what else is coming? Stable coins have proved to be the best product market fit for DeFi today, right? And the good thing about stable coins is you don't need to keep pumping money into the system to incentivize people, right? It's, it's pegged to an underlying asset. So I think stable coins are going to continue to be a large part in the adoption of DeFi. So one thing that stable coins are is they're actually what's called a tokenized real world asset because you've got this thing on chain, this token on chain that represents this thing that's off chain, right? And it's pretty much the most widely adopted tokenized real world asset so far. And I think in the future we're going to see more of this happen. So we're going to see other things tokenized. Bonds, cars, houses, art, crops, anything that has value that can be traded in the traditional financial world. You might ask, well, why would I want to tokenize something like this? It basically boils down to a few things. So you can get better liquidity when it's tokenized and put on chain. 
Uh, you have more transparency when it's tokenized, which I think we all agree is a good thing for when you're dealing with finance. Um, you, can f you can fractionalize it. You can split it into a million pieces and have people, lots of people own fractions of it. Uh, and the composability aspect that blockchains offer. So some real uh, unique value propositions for tokenized reward assets. But the thing about these assets is they live in a world of law, courts, legal systems, et cetera. And blockchains live in a world of maths, physics, and cryptography. So there's definitely a bit of a, a challenge of how do we bridge this world together? So a couple of points to make is privacy is going to become a very important topic. So when you're dealing with credit and things like that, there's certain things you can't publish on chain or you don't want the public to know. So um, that's going to be a very important challenge to overcome. And there was a good talk this morning on uh, DECO, Privacy Pre Preserving Oracles. Um, if you didn't check that out before, I highly recommend you watch the replay. Another thing is how do we evaluate some of these real-world assets? Because for an Oracle network to report the price of Bitcoin, it's pretty easy. But what about how much a house is worth, how much an art piece is worth? A lot of these require local knowledge, so that's going to be another obstacle to overcome. Uh, in addition to this, if you're going to be serving the 99, other 99% with tokenized reward assets, you, know, you need systems that scale, and finally regulations. So um, DeFi and crypto in general as well is going to be impacted by existing and up and coming regulations. And before some of these tokenized reward assets, uh, more of them are bought on chain, the regulatory landscape will likely change. So what's the end game here? What does DeFi look like in the long term? What does success for DeFi look like? And like I said before, I think there'll be a convergence where TradFi is going to come together and use DeFi. So um, you're still going to have the unique benefits of DeFi, the open permissionless, direct control of your assets, um, and, and all of those other things. Um, but in the end, most people are just going to call it finance, most likely, right? Because when you change the way the world works to use these strictly superior blockchain-based systems, you know, that becomes that new world, right? So um, DeFi is probably not the best term because there's other aspects that are just as important, right? What about the open and permissionless aspect of it? What about the self-sovereignty where you control your assets, right? So um, I think in the end, this is where the future of DeFi is heading. Uh, the, for most people, they, might, they probably won't call it DeFi. It's just going to be finance for them. Still going to use blockchains. They'll, they'll still optionally have control over the assets where people like Robinhood can't stop them from using them. It'll still be openless and uh, permissionless, but it would just be called finance. And I just want to end by saying um, capitalism and, uh, sorry, I just want to end by saying, you know, we can't imagine what's going to be invented in the coming years, just like how we can't imagine the concept of a flash loan. So um, it's just a really exciting time to be uh, in the space right now. There's my contact details if you want to reach out to me. Very happy to chat with anyone about DeFi or, or even just smart contracts in general. Um, thank you very much.